widespread tolerance of such depravities. It is the time for action. This amendment must be supported. Polak. I pay tribute to the movers of this amendment and in particular pay tribute to my noble friend, for he is my friend, uh, the noble Lord Alton, for his tenacity and passion. On the 29th of October 2018, following the horrific attack at the Tree of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh, when 11 people were gunned down, I spoke in this chamber and I posed the question, have we learnt nothing from history? And I went on to say that it's nice to stand shoulder to shoulder and offer sympathy, but it is action that is now required. My Lord's Amendment 9 gives us a chance to take action. My Lord's wringing our hands and mouthing nice words will deter no one. Just three weeks ago, I paid tribute to the noble Lord, Lord Sachs, in this chamber, and was struck by how many noble lords from all parties and none, and from all traditions and none, have spoken of him with such affection and admiration. And I've been rereading some of his writings, and in so doing, I came across a lecture from the 17th of February 2004 entitled, Never Again but will we ever learn the lessons of history? The lecture by Rabbi Sachs was at a national service taking place to mark the 10th anniversary of the genocide against the Tutsi in Rwanda, where he described that unimaginable orgy of violence, people hacked to death by machetes in a, in a country where perpetrators and victims had previously lived together as neighbours. Rabbi Sachs continued by explaining that the next day, the 18th of February 2004, was Yom HaShoah, Holocaust Memorial Day in the Jewish calendar and explained that apart from genocide, the Holocaust and the Rwandan tragedy had two things in common. First, they were preceded by deliberate dehumanization. The Jews were viewed as vermin, as lice. The Tutsi were in Yenzi, cockroaches. And as he, he put it, in this way, mass murder could be justified as a kind of sterilization, a necessary if painful operation to restore a nation to its health. The second similarity, he argued, was that both tragedies were known in advance. The international representatives who gathered at Evian in 1938 knew that a terrible fate was about to overtake the Jews in Europe. Yet they each declared they had no room for refugees. And in Rwanda, in 1990, the main Hutu newspaper issued its own equivalent of what he described as the Nuremberg Laws. By 1992, over half a million machetes had been distributed. In 1993, an international commission gave warning that a potential genocide was imminent. And the head of the UN peacekeeping force in 1994 passed on a warning that mass extermination was being planned. And as Rabbi Sachs so somberly acknowledged, both times humanity hid its face. My Lord's Amendment 9 is a straightforward, proportionate call to action, and as my noble, Lord, uh, my noble friend Lord Cormac said in his moving speech, it is saying that we simply cannot turn a blind eye, even in the interest of trade deals, when a state is guilty of genocide. And I know it's late, but my Lords permit me to state very clearly my support for the campaign led by Andrew Mitchell, MP. On the 21st of May in 2020, he wrote an article published in the Times under the headline, Britain has a duty to bring genocide accused to justice. My lords, no fewer than five alleged Rwandan genocide perpetrators live freely in the UK, four of whom receive benefits. Yet whilst the US and Canada, France, Belgium, Sweden, amongst others, have extradited those accused back to face justice in the Rwandan justice system where the death penalty was abolished over 10 years ago, my Lord, shockingly, we have not. Andrew Mitchell ended his words with the following. The souls of the slaughtered Tutsi cry out for justice, but Britain has turned a deaf ear. We should all be ashamed. And I call on the government to deal swiftly with this matter, certainly before the next Chogham to be held in Kigali, the Rwandan capital, next summer. And finally, my Lords, on the 23rd, 23rd of September 2020, I said in your Lordship's house, as the Uyghur Muslims, the, the Chinese uh, treatment of the Uyghur Muslims was horrific. Yet within days, as uh, uh, Lady Faulkner said, China was elected to sit on the United Nations Human Rights Council. We all witnessed the footage of the Uyghurs being herded onto trains, transported to camps, footage that is all too familiar. 
Many of us who have heard first-hand accounts of the depredations of the Nazi camps know how major industrial companies ruthlessly use the slave labour in those camps to produce their goods and to make their fortunes. My Lords, is it going to be a case of business as usual, as companies profiteer on the blood, the sweat and the tears of today's slave labour, or are we prepared to do something about it? My Lords, Rabbi Sachs, towards the end of his presentation, said that people often ask, ask, where was God in the Holocaust? He maintained it was the wrong question. The real question was, where was man? He suggested it sometimes appears as if we've learnt nothing, which is why memorials are necessary. My Lord, tonight, in this House, once again, we are confronted with that same question. Where were we when we had the chance to act against these those responsible for today's most grievous crimes against humanity. And for those who have said and will say that the Trade Bill is not the place for such an amendment, I say I will not join the hand-wringing and mouthing nice words brigade, but I will join those who will vote for action by supporting this amendment and would urge all noble lords to do likewise. Lord Purvis of